cervical myelopathy. Given the increasing number of seniors in our patient population, a significant and relatively common cause of neurological dysfunction should be understood. This recognition and management should be a crucial part of any chiropractor's knowledge base. So what is a myelopathy? It's the name given to spinal cord compression, which can be due to a host of structural problems, including protruding or herniated discs, infolding, thickening, and encroachment by the ligamentum flavum or ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament and more commonly caused by osteophytes secondary to cervical spine degeneration called spondylitic myelopathy. How common is cervical myelopathy? I think you'll be surprised that it is present in 90% of individuals by age 70 and is the most common form of spinal cord dysfunction in an individual over the age of 55. The condition is most common in males and those of Asian descent. Given chiropractors may utilize high-velocity, short-amplitude adjusting of the cervical spine or mobilization techniques on patients over the age of 55, there is the need to make every attempt at determining whether a myelopathy is present. We'll look later at what the literature says regarding managing patients with myelopathy. First, there are some key questions in need of answers. Although a detailed neurological examination is the current standard to diagnose the presence of cervical myelopathy, how sensitive and specific the exam is and how it compares to and correlates with special imaging is still unclear. What adds to the dilemma is that although special imaging is often used as the gold standard in confirming the diagnosis, the presence of radiographic spinal cord compression without clinical symptoms or physical signs of cervical myelopathy is not uncommon. For a patient with suspected or known myelopathy, is it safe to use manipulation? And finally, when is surgery considered necessary and what is its effectiveness compared to conservative management? We'll try to use the existing literature to find the answers. First, the basics. Cervical myelopathy is a distinct term that is used to indicate that the spinal cord is involved. This function may result in clinical symptoms that reflect the area affected. For example, if the anterior cord is involved, pathological reflexes and or hyperreactive deep tendon reflexes and motor weakness may be evident. Whereas, if the posterior cord is involved, gait disturbances, loss of dexterity, poor coordination, clumsiness, or sensory loss may be the dominant signs and symptoms. There are what are called long track signs that are used to indicate spinal cord involvement. These include numbers of indicators on examination, such as Hoffman's or Babinski's sign, clonus, hyperreflexia, the crossed abductor sign, the inverted supinator sign, and hand withdrawal. These abnormal responses reflect the disinhibition of the primitive afferent or efferent spinal cord pathways that are normally suppressed or modulated in the adult. Because of the various causes and diffuse nature of involvement, overlap may occur so that neck stiffness, headaches, shoulder pain, paresthesia, in one or both arms or hands, or other radiculopathic signs may also be present. These lower motor neuron radiculopathic findings may coexist with upper motor neuron lesion findings, creating an odd mix. For example, if there is involvement at a specific spinal cord level, especially if root involvement is also present, lower motor neuron findings are find, found at the level of the lesion, with upper motor neuron lesion findings below that level. For cervical spine stenosis with myelopathy, it is possible then to have lower motor neuron findings in the upper extremity with upper motor neuron lesion findings in the lower extremity. So that, for example, hyporeflexia may be found in the upper extremities with hyperreflexia in the lower extremities. Other mixed findings may reflect sensory clues that include unilateral findings of vibration loss with contralateral numbness, or if bilateral, a combination of numbness and proprioception problems manifesting as gait abnormalities. There is a dynamic element at play here. During flexion, the spinal cord lengthens. Posterior vertebral osteophytic ridges may then become more compressive in this position. With extension, the ligamentum flavum may buckle into the spinal cord, creating even more compression. Radiographically, a suspicion of central canal stenosis may be indicated primarily on a lateral cervical x-ray. Measure from the posterior vertebral body to the laminopedical junction to estimate the size of the central canal. Less than 13 millimeters warrants concern, and less than 10 millimeters is an indication of absolute stenosis. Another approach used is the TORG ratio. This is the ratio between the sagittal spinal canal diameter and the sagittal vertebral body diameter. 
On this graphic, it is A divided by B. A torque ratio of less than 0.82 is considered evidence of stenosis. On MRI, features that are used diagnostically are primarily viewed on sagittal images. They are evidence of spinal cord compression, which is indicated by an indentation on the spinal cord parenchyma, and T2 signal abnormality in the spinal cord, which is indicated by the presence of a hyperintense or brighter signal within the spinal cord parenchyma. Now, this should be confirmed on axial images to avoid an artifact effect causing a false positive. So how sensitive and specific is MRI? MRI has been shown to be 79 to 95% sensitive and 82 to 88% specific, with a positive likelihood ratio of between about 4 to 8 and negative likelihood ratio of 0.06 to 0.27 for identifying selected abnormalities such as space-occupying tumors, disc herniation, and ligamentous ossification. So here's the problem. Although special imaging is the gold standard, in some patients, the presence of radiographic spinal cord compression is seen without clinical symptoms or physical signs of cervical myelopathy. Myelopathic findings are seen in 16% of asymptomatic patients less than 64 years of age, increasing to 26% of those greater than 64 years of age. A recent article published in JMPT in 2011 attempts to answer the question regarding the value of the physical examination in detecting cervical spine myelopathy. This systematic review is a follow-up to an earlier article by Cook et al. in evaluating the reliability of the physical examination for cervical myelopathy published in the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy in 2009. In the 2011 systematic review by Cook et al., the researchers used the PRISMA guidelines, the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis. The PRISMA uses a 27-item checklist to assist in reporting the results of a systematic review or meta-analysis. Of 222 studies, only 18 articles met the criteria, and after further vetting, only 12 remained. Then the researchers used an evaluation tool for diagnostic studies called QUADIS, which stands for Quality Assessment of Diagnostic Accuracy Studies. A high quality rating was indicated if studies reached scores of 10 or greater. Moderate quality if scores were an 8 or 9, low quality if scores were 7 or lower. The researchers note that most published studies for clinical tests used to diagnose cervical myelopathy are poor or moderate in quality. The researchers then made an effort to homogenize the results by combining them into three types of tests, gait or balance, pathological signs, and deep tendon reflex changes. For the category of gait or balance, both abnormal gait, represented by ataxia, wide base gait, or spastic gait, and a positive static or dynamic Romberg sign was very specific but not sensitive for cervical spine myelopathy. For the pathological signs category, Hoffman sign, Babinski's, and clonus were also very specific, but not very sensitive for cervical spine myelopathy. For the deep tendon reflex changes category, it was found that, as with the other findings, hyperreflexia was very specific, but not very sensitive. For the upper extremity, the bicep, biceps reflex was specific, and the Achilles reflex for the lower extremities. The inverted supinator sign may be the most sensitive myelopathic test, according to this review. If you're unfamiliar with this test, it is similar to the brachioradialis reflex. The doctor places the patient's forearm in slight pronation on the examiner's knee and applies a few quick strikes near the radial stylate process. The pathologic response is finger flexion or slight elbow extension. Tests were then combined into a cluster analysis. The combination of tests analyzed were the Babinski, inverted supinator, and Hoffman sign, and gait dysfunction represented by a spastic or wide base gait or ataxia, and greater than the age of 45. If only one of five tests was positive, or another way to say it, if four out of five tests were negative, this equaled a sensitivity of 0.94 and a negative likelihood ratio of 0.18, good for ruling out myelopathy. If there were three out of five positive tests, this equaled a positive likelihood ratio of 30.9, and a post-test probability of 94%. We'll now include a discussion of MRI and its role in the diagnosis of cervical myelopathy, again referring to an article by Cook et al. in JMPT in 2008. 
followed by an article evaluating observer variability on CT and MRI interpretation of cervical spine stenosis, published in the American Journal of Neuroradiology. Both articles conclude that the kappa values or reliability of interpretation of MRI is adequate, but by no means perfect. The Cook study found that the intra-examiner reliability was good, but not the inter-examiner reliability. The Stafira et al. study found that when comparing the location of involvement, inter-examiner reliability was quite high. However, when looking at cause or severity, the inter-examiner reliability was only 0.4 and 0.37 respectively, not stellar. An important question is what is the correlation between signs and symptoms of cervical myelopathy and special imaging findings of spinal cord involvement? A study by Harrop et al., published in Spine in 2010, attempts to answer this question. In this study, there were 103 cervical degenerative spines. Clinical myelopathic signs were found in 54 of the 103 patients indicated by greater than one long track sign. The remaining 49 non-myelopathic patients served as a control group for this study. Gender was fairly equally represented with no obvious differences in gender for myelopathic findings. The mean age of this study group was 53 years. However, the myelopathic patients had an increased mean age with an increasing risk related to age. Some important observations were that the most common sign was gait abnormality found in 91% of the myelopathic patients. Surprisingly, the Babinski sign was the only sign not present in at least half of the myelopathic patients at 44%. Lower extremity hyperreflexia was more common than upper extremity at 81% compared to 67% respectively. What was the correlation between MRI and exam findings? Cord compression was present in 62% of patients with 35% demonstrating T2 signal changes within the spinal cord parenchyma. This finding correlated 100% of the time to clinical findings of myelopathy. 84% of patients had myelopathy evident on the clinical examination. No patients without spinal cord compression presented with findings on clinical exam. The likelihood of myelopathy increased with three predictors. Cord signal hyperintensity with an odds ratio of 11.4, sensory loss with an odds ratio of 16.9, and age with an odds ratio increase of 1.10 per year past the age of 45. Let's move on to the big question. Is there any evidence or direction for what chiropractors should utilize in the management of myelopathy? Surprisingly, there is very little to base decision-making on, in particular with regard to the safety or efficacy of spinal manipulation. A case series by Murphy, Hurwitz, and Gregory is the only study other than a few case studies evident in the literature. This study may be helpful in providing a process for evaluating patients and provides some preliminary evidence of success with manipulation. The study entitled Manipulation in the Presence of Cervical Spinal Cord Compression, a case series, followed 27 patients with neck and arm pain and MRI evidence of cervical spinal cord compression. What is important to note is that none of the patients had severe or acute myelopathy and none had signal changes within the spinal cord parenchyma. Only three patients had upper motor neuron signs, two of which were treated with high-velocity, low-amplitude adjusting. So there are some limitations to extrapolation to all myelopathic patients. Nineteen of the patients were treated with high-velocity, low-amplitude adjusting, and eight with a low-velocity muscle energy approach. The mean improvement was 70%, with a wide range of 0 to 100%. Mean improvements were as follows. The Bournemouth Neck Disability Questionnaire Improvement was 23.7 points, or 31%. On the Neck Disability Index, improvement equaled 6.4 points, and on the Numerical Pain Rating Scale, 3.9 points all indicating a clinically significant difference. No new neurological signs developed and no major complications were seen. So it does appear that in patients with early and mild cervical myelopathy, manipulation may be a safe and somewhat effective approach. What may have influenced these results is that the researchers placed all patients in a pre-manipulative position. This is in essence setting up without thrusting to determine if symptoms peripheralize into the arm or arms. 
If so, another adjusting position without peripheralization should be utilized. There have been two Cochrane reviews evaluating the effectiveness of surgery in the management of cervical myelopathy. Although separated by nine years, the researchers came to the same conclusions. In the 2001 review, investigators determined that although the short-term effects of surgery were superior to conservative management for pain, weakness, or sensory loss, the effect was lost at one year, where there were no significant differences between the two groups. For those with a mild functional deficit associated with cervical myelopathy, there were no significant differences two years following treatment. The 2010 Cochrane Review came to the same conclusion but added that although patients may obtain faster relief with surgery when compared to physiotherapy or hard-collar immobilization, the long-term effects were no different. A recent Japanese study published in 2011 examined the effectiveness of surgery for ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. This review concluded that there was no evidence that supports the usefulness of surgery for patients with ossification of the PLL without or with mild cervical myelopathy. What conclusions can we draw from all of this evidence that might lead to a management approach? It appears from the literature that patients with mild myelopathy indicated by either MRI evidence of spinal cord compression without spinal cord changes indicated by T2 high signal changes or patients with mild symptoms of cervical myelopathy may be initially managed with high-velocity, low-amplitude adjusting. The option of surgery seems reserved for those with more advanced changes on MRI indicating parenchymal involvement or advanced or severe symptoms. Surgery for those with mild symptoms seems no more effective than conservative management with physiotherapy or manipulation. Additional options that have been advocated have included the Cox flexion traction approach, activator, the McKinsey protocol, or traction in general. Let's develop a reasonable care pathway based on what is known in the literature, which should then be modified by your clinical experience and the specific patient in front of you. Ultimately, this is your decision with the patient fully informed and consenting. For any patient with symptoms of radiculopathy or myelopathy, perform a neurological examination including sensory testing, deep tendon reflex testing, pathological reflex testing including the inverted supinator sign, Hoffman's, Babinski's, and Clonus, and tests for gait and balance. Include radiographs as part of the evaluation including a cervical series with an interpretive focus on the lateral and oblique films. Lateral for estimation of the spinal canal size, and obliques for IVF bony encroachment. Using all of these findings, decide whether special imaging is necessary or whether a trial of conservative management is reasonable. Myelopathic exam findings should warrant special imaging to determine the degree of involvement prior to using manipulation. If MRI indicates both spinal cord compression and T2 signal changes within the spinal cord parenchyma, this degree of involvement may be an indicator to not use manipulation, but perhaps other non-manipulative approaches. If only compression is seen, proceed cautiously with manipulation after discussion with the patient and with their approval. 